song. Um, this is my father's world. Why should I be sad? Um, God is king. I think the Lord reigns. Some, some, some. Let me be glad. Um, that's a good summary of what the Christian life should be. Uh, that our concept of joy and everything else. Um, well, we want to, as we usually do, pick up where we left off this morning, only from a different perspective. So, uh, grab your Bibles, turn to Romans chapter 12. Romans 12. And uh, we are wanting to look at a really just, just a very practical passage of Scripture. There's nothing here that will be brand new or anything you've never heard of before. And that is kind of the point, is the constant reminder we have of these very basic points. Romans 12, we're going to read verses 9 to 21. If you will stand with me in the reverence of God's word. Heart wrench of inspiration of the Holy Spirit. Let love be genuine. For what is evil, or faster what is good. Love one another with brotherly affection. How do one another and show an honor? Do not be slothful in zeal, be fervent in spirit, serve the Lord. Rejoice in hope, be patient in tribulation, be constant in prayer. Contribute to the needs of the saints. Seek to show hospitality. Bless those who persecute, be blessed and do not curse them. Rejoice with those who rejoice, weep with those who weep. Live in harmony with one another, not be haughty, but associate with the lowly. Never be wise in your own sight. Repay no one evil for evil, but give thought to do what is honorable in the sight of all. If possible, as so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. Beloved, never avenge yourselves, but leave it to the wrath of God, for it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. To the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he's thirsty, let him uh, give him something to drink. For by so doing, you will heap burning coals on his head. Not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Let's go over prayer. Mm-hmm. Father, Lord, I know that this is but elementary uh, uh, Christianity here. Um, love. Be loving, be good. I mean, not really more complicated than that. But the fact that Paul had to remind the Romans is why we are having to remind ourselves that if we understand the gospel, we should understand what this text says. But more than just understand, we have to apply it. Help us to be the sort of people with radical love and grace in our lives. Lord, as always, may I decrease so you can increase. In your son we pray. Amen. I recently finished uh, a book on um, Abraham Lincoln. For those who don't know, he used to be president of the United States. Um, it, it was about Lincoln's um, lifelong confrontation with death. Now, if you've ever studied history, really pre-modern history, you're going to know that this is a story you could write with any major character. In fact, uh, there are books like that with Martin Luther. We had to read one in seminary where there's a whole a study of Luther's uh, that, that death was all around him. And of course, that is reality. That before the modern era, let's just say the turn of the 20th century, uh, before the discovery of penicillin or germs um, or uh, a modern medicine um, or uh, any of the sort of things that we take for granted now, what you had was a life filled with death. If you were a woman, you, you would be raised and uh, you would be trained to be domestic, domestic, right? You would be working the home and raise children and all that. But one of your main goals would have as many children as possible, knowing that it's very likely one of those births will kill you. And if you survive labor, uh, at some point, um, you will lose some of your children in infancy, in toddlerhood, or before they were ever adults. Lincoln himself only had one child ever to make it to adulthood. Robert Lincoln. And sadly, Robert Lincoln witnessed multiple presidential assassinations, not only just his father, but he was a witness as uh, working in the administration. I think it's McKinley and, and Garfield. I could, I could have those details wrong. Um, and, and Lincoln himself uh, lost his mother at a very young age uh, and was really raised by a stepmother he was very fond of, living very close to his father. Um, some studies show that he, he lost his first real love, the woman he wanted to marry, died. Um, even as the war started, he lost some people he was very, very close to. And then in the middle of the war, on top of all the death of the casualties and everything else, where he would walk around the battlefields afterwards and see bodies being buried and bodies still out to be buried and everything else, um, he, he lost, he and Mary Todd lost um, their son, really. And never really healed from any of that. 
And that's Lincoln. He, again, he, you, could, you could just cross the board throughout all of human history. That death was just everywhere you went. So, you, so if, if you were to, to study uh, history, you would find that it seems like our ancestors were obsessed with death. And it's not that they were obsessed. They just couldn't escape it. Death was all around them. And one of the things that comes out of that sort of propensity of, of, of death, just, just death everywhere, is this idea of the good death. I don't know if you've ever heard of that, but, but certainly we still carry this myth with us even today. The good death was that if you were dying of disease, you would have a moment by which you would pull in your loved ones and you would give them final advice. Um, there's a story of Lincoln that when his mother was dying, that uh, he pulled his, her sons in, into her and, and, and gave them final instructions. Listen to your father and be good boys and stuff like that. See, in an age where death was everywhere, it was just important how you died than when and where you died. This was true even on the battlefield. We, we still have that today, right? I mean, think about it. I can have to put images up here of movie scenes where someone dies, and, and, and that would be a memorable scene. When Boromir, after betraying the fellowship in, in Lord of the Rings, uh, he, he has this death scene, right? Uh, in, in, in the movies, and it's a little different in the books. But Aragorn comes to his rescue, and he's going to die. And there, Aragorn, who's the rightful heir of the throne of Gondor, none of you understand what I'm talking about, but Boromir finally says to, to, to Aragorn, you know, my, my king, right? And here is the guy who, who wants the throne for himself. In his death, he surrenders that right to the man who, who rightly deserves it. Or perhaps a more infamous scene. Let me see if I can get it right. I'll never let go, Jack. I'll never let go. <clears throat> right? You know, you know the Titanic scene, right? And of course, the real controversy there is why, uh, what's her fate? Rose, or no one cares. She had plenty of room uh, for, for Jack or whoever he is uh, up her on that wood, or whatever it is that she's floating on. But no, she didn't want anyone to know what a terrible human being she was when she made it to shore. That's why she let him just die in the water. That's neither here nor there. And you watch any movie where there is a death scene, right? And what you're going to find is, is that there is going to be that, that idea of a good death. It isn't just that we die, it's how we die. And that, that we give final words of, of encouragement, final words of wisdom, final, a final act of heroism. And, and given that the book of Romans is, is all about how the death of Christ not just saves us, but sanctifies us. It is fitting that as Paul concludes this book, he is drawing our attention to final words of wisdom. In fact, you can take chapters 12 all the way to chapter 16, and it's very pastoral, it's very practical. And here is a fantastic example of this. Here, Paul sounds almost as much like Solomon as he does an apostle. He's just given basic words of wisdom, and, and they're quite pithy, right? So, so you get, let love be genuine. Well, all right, there you go. Um, uh, abhor what is evil. Well, that, that's a good thing to say, right? And they're very pithy, they're very straightforward. But, but, but what we see here is Paul laying out for us what is it that Christian love looks like. So let's start here, verses 9 and 13. Paul tells us that we should love other believers. Again, this is nothing new. You should love other believers. Notice verse 9, let love be genuine. If, if I remember my seminary days when we did preaching, that the whole point of every passage is you find the thesis of each passage, whether that's verbalized or not, it needs to be laid out. So let me verbalize here the thesis of these, of these final half of this chapter is right there in those four words. Let love be genuine. That is the whole point of everything Paul says in verses 9 to verse 21. Now the ESV, the, one, the Bible I'm using here says genuine. Your translation may use something like without hypocrisy. And those are perfectly fine translations. To be genuine is to be without hypocrisy. To genuinely love someone is to love them and not halfway love them or pretend to love them, so on and so forth. So the point is that Christian love should not come with footnotes. You know, like whenever you watch a commercial and, and here, here is a new medicine, and this medicine is, is going to fix all your problems. And then what do you get? Is you get a guy reading as fast as he can all the ways this medicine may make your life miserable and probably kill you, right? That is not how your love should function. Isn't that? My love will be genuine so long as X, or in most cases Y, or maybe if Z takes place, it'll be a little differently. No, no, no. Paul's point is no footnotes. Let your love be without hypocrisy. Love in its purest sense gives without 
The man named, not pictured there, is of course the death of Christ. But he gives without demanding. Well, he demonstrates what that means, first of all, by showing us that we are called to love fellow believers. So uh, there he, he says, love one another, verse 10, with brotherly affection. Now, this is a play on words. You, you can get it even in English if you have a little bit of, of Greek knowledge. The city of Philadelphia is the city of Phileo Adelphoi. Brotherly Adelphoi, love, Phileo. Right? So the word philosophy, Phileo, Sophia, is, is the lover of wisdom, to love wisdom. So you can, you can already see. So the so way you translate brotherly love or a friendship love is often affection. <coughs> Right, so, so you see that he's playing with words here. It says, love one another with brotherly affection. Well, what he's really saying, and he has a play on words, show brotherly love to the brothers you love. Right? It's, it's, it's a fun little play on words. Now, we can translate that to be devoted or brotherly affection or simply love one another, but it's all the same. Now, you can read this and you say, well, well that, that's kind of an obvious point. And it's odd that he would need to say this. We would naturally assume that we would already know that we can need to love one another. But then again, how many of us need to remind ourselves we need to love our own family, our own genetic, biological family? There's people in your family right now. You put up with them on Thanksgiving, but you hope they don't come to Christmas. <laughs> right? Thanksgiving is enough. And you'll put up with Thanksgiving because you know you're supposed to be thankful, even for the things you're not thankful for. But Christmas, come on, Jesus deserved better than Uncle Joe, right? And we have to remind ourselves that we have to love, even our own family. The same is true whenever it comes to fellow believers. Loving other Christians isn't easy. And for some reason, we miss this. How often have, have we or, or, or others, even around this, this city and this county, have changed the congregation based off of personality differences? Because we found it hard to love X. One of the things I, I find myself saying with other pastors, something like, um, um, some some people require more bandwidth of love, right? For example, that if you remember the good old days with uh, modems, uh, 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 dial-up modems, internet, right? And so uh, it's it, it's dial tone, right? You, you connect to the internet. Well, if you have a 26k modem and you're trying to watch videos on YouTube, you don't have the bandwidth to do that. You know, you, you can't watch your favorite cat videos doing that. Don't have the, the the bandwidth. What you need is broadband, fiber, right? Whatever, whatever it is, like fiber, or whatever it might be. So, to some some of us, in order for us to love, some people are easy to love. I find my wife very easy to love. I find her parent. I remember I'm going to finish that. No, no, no. There's just some people. It takes a little extra effort, doesn't it? But we are called to love, nonetheless. Look, in every church and among believers in the world, there are weird people. You might be one of them. Very well might be. Ask your, ask your spouse if that is you. Well, to add more muscle to this command, he calls on Christians to outdo each other. Notice there, he love one another with brotherly affection. Outdo one another in showing honor. Outdo is a compound word. In Greek, you can make a word a compound word, not to give it a new meaning, but to, to, to make it a, 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 a more emphatic meaning. It literally means to, to go before. It's going before. The, the root word here could be translated as governor. In fact, in some places it, it is. The idea is that when it comes to love, you should lead in it. I think I used this illustration a few weeks ago that if you're the sort of person that will dim your lights on a country road when they dim theirs first, you're an awful, terrible person who should not be allowed to drive, right? You, you should just have in, in, in your own makeup as a human being the decency that when you see another car come and dim the lights. Otherwise, like, you should be in prison, right? I mean, you're such a terrible human being. So, too, when it comes to love, what we often do is we think, I will show brotherly affection when they show me brotherly affection first. It's a terrible way to live. It's a terrible way to live. Don't wait till someone else makes the first move or reciprocate with niceness or generosity. Love and to lead with it. He goes on there in verse 11. Do not be slothful in zeal. Be fervent in spirit. Serve the Lord. This enforces the idea that with love, he commands us to be hardworking in it. Love takes intention and work. This is why marital love has to move beyond the wedding. 
There's the old joke that men say all the time. You know, uh, you know, if, if their wife will complain, you never tell me you love me. And his answer is, I married you. I said I do, and I've done it, haven't I? I mean, what else you want from me? I work. I, 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 I provide. I protect. I, I serve. I do all this other stuff. Uh, what else do you want from me, right? Uh, love is something you have to work for, and it's something that's ver ver verbalized, and it requires action. Um, and it requires it to be a priority. If other things get in the way of demonstrating and showing love, then we have prioritized something above the simple gospel we've been given in our lives. We must guard our hearts. We must be careful with our words. We, we, in our marriage, we must make intimacy a priority. We, you must date your spouse. You have to talk to the people you love, provide, sacrifice, all, all that takes work. But we must do it nonetheless. Ecclesiastical love requires the same sort of focus. Finally, notice that what it looks like practically. Just, just to look at this, this, this list. First of all, we rejoice. Rejoice in hope. You see how love is connected to joy. Uh, and with that comes hope, right? And then perseverance. Be patient in tribulation. Love will get you through per, uh, tribulation more than anything. In fact, you can ask any, any, any doctor or nurse or anyone in the medical field. We have studies that back this up. People who are loved through their cancer through their medical trauma, whatever it might be, those are people who are more likely to survive and come out stronger. I mean, because this love is what will make you persevere. This is what made COVID so hard, wasn't it? I can imagine being a patient in the middle of COVID with a severe illness or disease, and no one was allowed to come just to sit in the same room with you. It's really quite scandalous when you, when you look back and think about what we did to each other. Because we need love to persevere. Be constant in prayer. So love associated prayer. Think about it. You stop praying for people you no longer love. And when you start praying for people, you will learn to love them. Generosity contributes to the needs of the saints and seek to show hospitality. Generosity, hospitality. Showing kindness and everything else. So this is not anything new here. We should love one another and act like we actually like each other. Not only that, but we should love our enemies. Again, we don't know this is new. In verses 14 21, he lays that out. Now, relatively speaking, loving other believers should be easy. At the very least, you share a common faith, a common worldview, a common joy, and a unifying message of hope. At the end of the day, you've got that. You may not like the same sports team. You may not even want to like sports the other despite them. You may not vote the same. You may not, you know, all this other stuff may be just radically different. Um, but because you have Christ as the unifying uh, center, there can be genuine love expressed be between the two. Blue collar and white collar uh, in Christ ought to be able to come together. One of the things I remember about going to Africa and Trinidad, going overseas, where it's two very different uh, cultures. Um, actually, I think my wife is about to share our trip to Trinidad with our mission kids uh, coming up soon. And uh, when, when we first got married. Is, is you'll find that I know no one in this country, but these believers I've come to work with, we already love each other. This is really amazing, isn't it? If, if you were to move to another community, I hope you don't, uh, but if you were to move to another community, my wife and I have had experiences. We've been all over the state. Everywhere we go, we already know there are people who love us and we love them. I mean, relatively speaking, it should be easy to, to love other believers, but anyone can do that. You go to any bar here in town that people frequent, and they all get along just fine. You can go to any uh, sports team, right? And they all reasonably get along just fine because they have something in common. But where it gets dicey is when here we are as, as believers being called to love those who do not reciprocate that love. In the New Testament, in the Bible in general, that is the very definition of love, that love is something that gives without demanding. It holds. It doesn't demand. Where we left off this morning in Matthew 5, Jesus picks up here, verse 44. I say, you love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. If you love those who love you, what reward do you have? Do not even the tax collectors do the same? If you greet only your brothers, what more are you doing than others? Do not even the Gentiles do the same? Yeah, that's easy. If you want to prove the depth of Christ's love and the transformation of your soul... Go love that person who will not look you in the eye. Don't forget them on your Christmas card list. Go still offer to mow their yard whenever uh, they, they just got back from surgery. Go show love to people who want to have nothing to do with you. 
came across this story. It starts out with a Florida man. Right? So you know it's going to be good, right? Here, here's, here's the story. A Florida man named Brian Stewart is facing assault and battery charges after deputies say he attacked his neighbors with a machete. On the machete was the word kindness. The story goes on. Neighbors told deputies they heard banging and yelling coming from the man's house all Wednesday. Just before midnight, one neighbor decided to go over and check on things and asked Stewart to keep it down. The man told deputy Stewart came running out of his front door with a machete-style knife that had the word kindness written on the blade. Another neighbor who saw what was happening stepped in to protect the other man ended up getting cut on his hand, deputy said. Stewart was charged with aggravated battery with a deadly weapon and aggravated assault with a deadly weapon. When Christians fail to love their enemies, we look no different. We walk around with a Bible that says kindness, and we try to destroy their lives. Remember that when you engage in the public square of politics. When you're frothing out of the mouth like everyone else, you have violated Scripture. When you're screaming and shouting about what someone said that hurt your feelings, how angry it made you, you're like a Florida man. Swinging a machete. The word's kindness written on the handle. What sets Christianity apart is the willingness to love even those who hate them with all of their heart. This is the lesson believers in a post Christian society must learn. What set Christian what would really set Christianity up in the Roman world in a post Christian society will look like a pre Christian society. If you don't believe me, turn on the television and see what is entertaining us these, these days. We're as sexualized, we're, we're as pagan as, as we've ever been. It looks just like the world before, before Christianity arose. But what set Christianity apart was love. When, when plague would enter into the city, and plagues were common. Again, death was everywhere. Plagues were common. And what the rich would do, I've told you this before, is they would flee to, to their houses in Florida. What Christians would do is they'd go out and get the wheelbarrows. And they'd find anyone sick at the uh, city fountain. That's where they all congregate because they at least have a source of water and everything else. They go get them, bring them into one of the wealthy members' homes, and turn into a hospital, risking their own lives. And many Christians die of taking care of the sick. What they found was because of that simple act of generosity and kindness, the survival rate in times of plague went through the roof. They loved their enemies, and not just their enemies, strangers. Notice verse fourteen. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse them. Again, that sounds like Jesus, doesn't it? And when we saw that in Matthew 5, not only that, but the blessed are they who, who are persecuted. The setting of this commandment should not be lost on us. In a matter of few months or years, depending on how you date the book of Romans, but certainly within at least, say, a decade or so, the city of Rome would be engaged in a series of targeted attacks against Christians by the order of, Roman, of the Roman emperor Nero. The story goes that because about a third of the city uh, uh, burned down, um, that would, and, and you know the, 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 the legend became that Nero was playing the fiddle while Rome burned. You probably heard that phrase. He needed an, 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 an escape, uh, a, a scapegoat, if you will. And so he blamed the Christians because no one liked the Christians anyway. And as a result, he, he led a massive persecution against them. Can I read to you from a pagan historian who was no friend of the Christians what he had to say about this? Tacitus is, is his name. Accordingly, an arrest was first made of all who pleaded guilty. These were Christians. Then upon their information, an immense multitude was convicted, not so much on the crime of fire in the city, you know, put the city to fire, as of hatred against mankind. They thought Christians hated mankind because they wouldn't sacrifice to the gods and they were accused of uh, cannibalism, actually, because they ate the body and drank the blood of some Jesus. I mean, you, you, can you imagine they had the internet with that sort of stuff? It would look like 2023. Mockery of every shirt was added to their deaths, covered with the skins of beasts. They were torn by dogs and perished. Some were nailed to crosses. Some were doomed to the flames and burnt to serve as a nightly illumination when daylight had expired. And here's the context of that, where they were turned into nighttime candles. Nero offered his gardens for the spectacle and was exhibiting a show in the circus. While he mingled with the people in the dress of a charioteer or stood aloft on a car, hence even for criminals who deserve extreme and exemplary punishment, there arose a feeling of compassion for the Christians. 
For it was not as it seemed for the public good to torture them this way, but to glut one man's cruelty that they were being destroyed. So within roughly a decade of Paul writing this commandment to bless those who persecute you and do not curse them, many of the believers reading this letter for the first time within a decade were turned into human torches. For the glutton paganism of Nero to light his garden of fire. Some are wrapped in animal skins to attract wild beasts who would just devour them in the gladiatorial games. Though it's under the Neroan uh, persecution that, according to tradition, both Paul and Peter were executed, among others. And despite such barbarity, the first Christians were commanded to love even those who hated them so much. Imagine that. Today, the average Christian can barely talk to someone who might vote differently than they do. John Fox's, uh, 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 Fox's Book of Martyrs, what we call it, I have a copy of it in my office. Man, I'm going to library now, no. It's really worth uh, the read. It's quite sober. He tells the story of two brothers, Christian brothers, Falsinus and jo Yolita, I'm afraid it's pronounced that, who, quote, bore their tortures with such patience that a pagan named Calisirius was so struck with admiration that he cried out in a kind of ecstasy, Great is the God of the Christians. For this, he, that is this pagan, was immediately arrested and put to the same tortures. And it's not just that they died. It's how they died. They died by loving their neighbors and loving their enemies. In that context, I would say loving our political opponents is a bare minimum for the Christian. And as, as hatred continues to rise in this Christianity, we've seen this in particular in recent weeks, we will need to remember that we owe our attractors above all else the love of Christ. There is more than enough hate in this world. We don't need to add to the pile. But what does that look like in daily life, loving our enemies and loving others? That's what he does in verses 15 to the degree. Let's look at them real quick. I'm quite exhausted now. So, um, first of all, be present, verse 15. Rejoice with those who rejoice, weep with those who weep. Learn to rejoice with those who rejoice, learn to weep with those who weep. It sounds so simple, doesn't it? This is rare that we do it. Most of us struggle to genuinely celebrate with others because of our envy, pride, and bitterness. What if your coworker gets that promotion over you? Would you celebrate it? Celebrate with them? What if that other church experiences revival and they grow by leaps and bounds? Will we celebrate with them? What if that pagan had that other baby while we're still struggling to conceive? Will we go over, hold the baby, and rejoice with that couple? What about weeping? We were too quick with I told you so's and I knew better and all that sort of stuff, aren't we? Yeah, they shouldn't have started on those drugs. Yeah, they shouldn't have pursued that lifestyle. Yeah, they should have been more grateful, more patient, more kind. But when people mourn, students of the cross should be the first to comfort them. But not only should we be present, we should walk in humility. This is verse 16. Uh, live in harmony with one another, not be haughty, but associate with the lowly. Never be wise in your own sight. The world has an abundant supply of hate. It certainly has a greater supply of pride. And nothing ruins lives quicker than that. Pride is anti-gospel. A good example of this is when two of Jesus' disciples, brothers, uh, came to Jesus and said, Hey, can one of us be on your right, one of us be on your left in the kingdom? You know what Jesus said? Sure, if you can handle it, right? He's like, do you think you can drink the cup I'm about to drink from? They're like, sure. You know, they, Remember, the disciples are probably like middle school age, maybe freshman in high school. And every young man at that age is convinced they can do anything. When you hear a young middle schooler say, Hey, watch this. They are about to fail, but they believe they will not. And that's the real joy, because you didn't get to make fun of them. But anyways, right? And so they think, yeah, yeah, we can take it on. We're able. And, and this is what Jesus ultimately uh, What happens is all the other disciples got uh, jealous of them, right? Because, well, oh, I'm, I'm better than you, <laughs> right? That's the way young men are. But Jesus says this. You know that the rulers of the Gentiles lorded over them, and their great ones exercise authority over them. It shall not be among, so among you. Whoever will be great among you must be as your servant. Whoever will be first among you should be your slave. Even as the Son of Man came not to serve but to serve, not to be served but to serve. Give his life as a ransom. You see, death lies at the center of that. Christ says, I come to give my life to you. You should give your life to one another. The humble man can and often does live in harmony with others. 
Because he doesn't stir drama. He's a better listener than talker. He's willing to lose. He doesn't discriminate. He doesn't walk around trying to prove himself. Be, be humble. Walk in humility. Thirdly, seek peace. Verses 17 and 19. Repay no one evil for evil. Give thought to do what is honorable in the sight of all. If possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. Beloved, never avenge yourselves, but leave it to the wrath of God. For it is written, vengeance is mine. I will, I will repay. Seek peace. This still fits within the context of loving those who persecute you, right? You're not seeking to be persecuted. As if it's some sort of badge of honor. You're willing to be persecuted. You don't seek out trouble. It's a very different thing entirely. Revenge is, is seeking a dead end. Seeking a dead end. This has been the curse of humanity. Because revenge begets revenge. Retaliation begets retaliation. Talk about that this morning. You all know my favorite book in the whole Bible, Beowulf's poem. And in the end, when Beowulf dies, spoiler alert, it opens up with a funeral and ends with a funeral. The Beowulf's trusted chief of staff, if you will, uh, Wiglaf, he, he laments Beowulf's death not just because he's lost a friend and a king. He laments his death because he knows Beowulf kept the other Vikings away. You see, Beowulf didn't just slay the, the, the dragon in, uh, among the Geats. He has kept at bay the other dragons that are the Danes and the Swedes and everyone else. And, and the minute it's discovered there's all this dragon horde of goats, they're all going to come seeking revenge. And that's the cycle Wiglaf laments. What will break this cycle? And I believe Beowulf, it reveals it's a bunch of Christian missionaries coming to talk about Jesus. But that's another time and place. We'll waste time. Finally, practice love, verse 20 to 21. To the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he's thirsty, give him something to drink. For by so doing, you will heap burning coals on his head. Not be overcome by evil. Don't overcome evil with good. Love is sacrificial and it is costly. Real love cares for the needs even of those who will not take care of yours. Feed the hungry, regardless of their politics or their kindness. Give water to the thirsty, even if they can't look you in the eyes. In the end, our hope is that good will triumph as in, 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 the, in the final days. But you, you cannot control how the world will view you and I. I wish we could. I really wish we could. But we can control how we love the world. For that, we must be obedient to it. It's a simple message, isn't it? There's nothing new here. It isn't always easy to obey. And that is why we always must keep our eyes on the cross. If your eyes are on Jesus, they're not on you. And when our eyes are on Jesus, we realize that gospel love is more radical than we're willing to admit. And if we would apply gospel love, the church would be healthier, our lives would be better, and our society would benefit from it. Let's go to the Lord's Prayer. Father, I ask you to be so kind to help us in this regard. Yeah. We would love one another as fellow believers. We would love those outside of this church with the same gospel love that Christ has shown us prior to our conversion. Lord, it's, it's easy to say that in the context of the church that we should love one another. But Lord, it's really difficult, becoming more difficult because we feel the rising tide of hate targeted against believers. And we've seen instances of that this week. We can be targeted to death and somehow we're still the ones to be blamed. But we are called to love. It doesn't make sense in the flesh. But it does make sense in light of the gospel. If you can forgive those guilty of hanging you upon the cross,